This is Movers and Shakers, where we interview the upcoming generation of make it happen multifamily investors to share their story. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbaro, co founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, mentor, and I am joined by my co host, my brosif, Joshua Ryan Rusin. Mr. Josh, how are we doing today? Gino, doing well, my friend. Very excited to next week be in Orlando. We have the, the money mixer coming up. And then uh, I had a, a John Maxwell conference, which actually got canceled. So I got a little bit of a vacation plan on, to take that place now. Gino, what are you excited about? Josh, you know what that means? It's another three, four days in my house. The food bill goes up. The, you know, the kids are going to be at the pool all day. I got to do some homeschooling. Maybe you're going to teach the kids when you're here next week. How about that, huh? <laughs> All right. Sounds like a win-win to me. Good, good. Uh, I love our guests today, Josh. Let's get into our guests and let's t- get into their story and let's make this one happen, bro. Yeah. Today we have a double header on, on top here. So we have Dan Kruger and Anthony Vincino. Uh, a little bit about them. Dan has acquired nearly 70 units spread across six buildings by successfully executing the refi and roll strategy since leaving his corporate finance world job less than two years ago. And then Anthony. So Anthony is a best-selling author, investor, and small business operator who builds successful companies by designing efficient systems that scale and maintaining focus on the end user experience. Anthony and Dan joined forces in late 2019 to create Invictus Capital, raise 1 million in capital, and execute their first syndication. Welcome to the show, Dan and Anthony. How you guys doing? Awesome. Doing good. Thanks for having us, guys. Love it. All right. So Dan, we've had you on the show before. So let's, uh, Anthony, I want to dive a little bit about you, your background, how you two met, and then we'll, we'll kind of dive into the company and the deal itself. Sure. So for me, I came from oh, kind of a mixed background. I'm very entrepreneurial, like building things, not with my hands so much, but I like building businesses and systems and seeing how they interact. Um, before uh, real estate, I was operating a light manufacturing business. And I still am. And that's where my heart and soul really is, is in rock climbing industry. Um, And then maybe about two years ago or so, I started looking at real estate as this really interesting model where the building blocks themselves are relatively simple and they click together relatively simple and you can build really complicated, awesome things with them. So kind of like a a Lego, right? And that's one of the things that really attracted me to, to real estate is just how simple and understandable it is and how Really, it's only limited by your ambition. And so I dove into real estate, started small, um, went and did the, the small multifamily thing. Just wanted to learn the ropes and the systems. How, does, how do you interact with tenants? How do you understand tenant ordinances and working with the city? How do you execute like a refinance and uh, maintenance repairs? And so I did that on a small scale with a triplex and a, and a quadplex. And then I started saying, okay, now that I understand this, how do I build up from here? And the goal was always go bigger, go bigger, go bigger. Um, Because I think the efficiencies of scale are much more interesting as you get larger. You can drive down operational expenses. You can just serve more people uh, more easily. And that's something that I'm really interested in doing. And so I started branching into the multifamily education sphere. And I met Dan, um, what was it, last September? Yeah, after I got back from yeah, right, right, right from Italy. We were just talking about that before we hit record. We we're talking about Italy. <laughs> yeah, and so Dan and I we met at a conference in here in the Twin Cities, uh, the North Star Conference. It's actually coming up again in I think April. And so if you guys are in the Twin Cities or you know even thinking about traveling, this would be a really great uh, resource. And so we met there, and it was it wasn't so much about finding a partner and saying like how can we work together. It was more like oh what are you working on? Here's what I'm working on. We saw some kindred spirits and we just became friends and just stayed in touch and communicating and trying to add value to one another when the opportunity arose. And that's something that I think really attracted us to each other is that we're both kind of almost competitive in how we add value to each other. Keep <laughs> each other's stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like how can I, how can I one up this and add more value than he just added to me, which gets hard at a certain point, but it's a really good challenge. So We, at some point in December or so, Dan was working on a deal, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, I think, in, you know, we just saw an opportunity where our skills and weaknesses come together in a synergistic way, and we said, well, why don't we do this together? We can go much further and faster together than if we were to go alone. So we did, and so far it's been been really good. So who named the company Invictus? Uh, Well, that's a funny story. uh, (laughs) I'll let you tell that one. (laughs) Well, uh, it wasn't our first choice. Um, first choice we went with, because um, originally 
I was operating under the brand of DGK Acquisitions, it's my initials, you bring a partner on board, it doesn't make sense for it to still have one guy's name. So we needed a new name uh, for branding purposes. So initially we went with a company we called uh, Veritas, which was Latin for truth. Pretty cool, right? Well, we weren't the first ones to think about that. Uh, there was another Veritas out in Manhattan, a very similar business model that uh, had all aspects of that name trademarked. And so about 24 hours after we posted our rebrand video on social media, we got a, a very formal letter from their lawyers telling us to kindly cease and desist all use of Veritas Capital. So, <laughs> so after some back and forth with our lawyers, um, we came up with Invictus. So, um, and what does Invictus stand for? What does it mean? Uh, un unconquered. unconquered. Yeah. And so Invictus was one of our second choices and it's actually really fitting in this context because, you know, a lot of people might um, view getting smacked down within 24 hours by this billion dollar company as like, oh, maybe this is a sign that I shouldn't be doing this. Um, I but Dan and I would go, it as a sign that our social media has a has Yeah, reach. it's a good thing, it's right? People awesome. are seeing you. So <laughs> we took that as we might, we might have failed on this one, but we haven't been defeated. So we're going to keep rolling forward and um, as long as you, as long as you never stop, you never fully fail. Man, Josh would have killed me if I did that. You know, I'd be like, Gino, don't hit the send button. What are you doing? Are you <laughs> Josh is always like test and test and test and test and the test and he doesn't hit the button. I'm like, just hit the damn button. If we get a letter from a billion dollar company, we'll just stop. You know what I'm saying? What's the, yeah. what's the, what's the worst thing, right, Josh? Yeah. <laughs> we only had it for 24 hours. So that's like, that's <laughs> the power of being really small, good. right? Like the power of being small is that you can pivot really quickly. Uh -huh. And so you don't have to take these hits right on the chin. You can kind of roll with it. And so, uh -huh. you know, we might be small now, but that's it. We're going to use all the advantages that that kind of equates to. So. Mm -hmm. Dan, I want you to jump into your model a little bit because you are vertically integrated. Uh, yeah. you, you, you manage your own stuff. You know, talk about that a little bit with the listeners because some of them are out there saying, I'm going to get third-party property management, but some are also saying, I want to manage my own stuff. So can you just give an overview of what you're doing? Yeah, well, I think it works both ways. It just uh, kind of comes down to what jives with your personality type. Uh, mm -hmm. if you're the type of individual like like I am where I, I, I tend to micromanage things and I like to have, I like to be in the weeds and I like to maintain as, as much control as possible then having uh, management in-house is ideal because you can control pretty much everything from the top down mm -hmm. uh, it will reduce costs as well because um, we basically you know, pick our management fee when we put our deals together and right now we just have it structured so that our management fee just covers the cost of uh, our employees or salaries so you know, we can keep our costs down relative to other guys putting together similar deals. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's tons of guys killing it who are doing it with third-party management. So if you align yourself with a really good company, then you can make it happen. It just kind of depends on your business model, your goals, and your personality style, in my opinion. So, Dan, when you joined the Academy, you were in the process of the 36-unit deal, correct? In the process of the raise. 32. Yep. You're, in the, you're in that process of that. So, I mean, what did, what did you learn? What, what did the Academy do to help you to get that deal across the line? Um, talking with Bill, Bill's the coach I was working with primarily, and then obviously you helped out quite a bit as well. Um, talking with him about some of the syndicate or some of the nuances you need to syndications was hugely mm -hmm. valuable because I've done several deals before, but none of the syndication format. So, mm -hmm. um, the aspect of raising capital and dealing with the deadline was, um, was a little nerve wracking at first and being able to talk through a few different scenarios with guys who have done this uh, many times before and have thousands of units was nice as far as just um, providing confidence that we were doing it the right way and not having mm -hmm. to worry about oh, what if, you know, what if this is the wrong way or what if there's a better way? Like having someone in the room with you, essentially, even if it's virtually, uh, who's got thousands of units and who's done this for you know, 10 plus years telling you, yeah, this is the way you should be doing it is invaluable when you're doing your first syndication. So that was, and, that was basically the catalyst for me jumping on board. Was yeah. So I remember you, you, you got it at a good, good price per door. What is the oh, yeah. uh, strategy with this property that you have now? Yeah. So we got it at uh, 75 a door, which is um, really good up here in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, comparable properties like that would go for about 90 to hundred a door. Um, so the business plan is to upgrade the uh, tenant, tenant base and upgrade the units, uh, installing new appliances, new flooring, uh, new light fixtures, um, redo the common areas, uh, basically just make everything look a heck of a lot better, spending about five grand per unit. Mm -hmm. So we'll essentially be into it for about 80 a door and everything else in the area that we've refied recently is appraised for uh, over 100 a door. So, you know, we're into it at our basis is 80 and uh, it should be worth uh, over 100 a door by the time we're done with things. And, and what looking now we're Knocking that, things down pretty quick. That's awesome. So, what are you are going to do? You, you're going to sell this property. You're going to refinance and give capital back to the investors. What's the exit strategy on this one? 
Uh, we're definitely going to do a refi initially because we're going to be done with the business plan within 12 months. Right now, we're right. actually going to have the bulk of the work done by May, which is actually a lot quicker than we initially planned on. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to do a refi and return a decent amount of capital right off the bat there. And uh, the way the the deal was put together as far as marketing is concerned, we had a five-year hold period on it. But uh, after talking to every one of the investors that's in the deal, I think we've got like 12 or something like that. It's a pretty small group. Um, pretty much everyone else is on the same page as, as we are, where uh, we would prefer to buy and hold for mm -hmm. long periods of time and then just uh, refi every so often to you know lock in these historically low rates, lock in longer term debt, and just keep cash flow. I mean, it's a good asset. And after the reposition's over, it's, it's, a, it's an easy one to manage. Um, you know, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to, to sell it. I, I love that. So I want uh, tips from both of you for raising capital. Anthony, go first. What, what tips would you give the listeners to raising capital? And one thing I like that Dan said, maybe all your investors are on the same page as you. I think that's the most important thing. If you have investors that want to flip out in two years and you have ones that want to go long term, that may not be the right fit because your partnership is great. Your partnership, it seems like you're on the same level, same wavelength, yeah. same stuff. So maybe that's one of the things we should think about with, part, with investors. Absolutely. If they're not the right fit for us, I would say maybe that's a pass. I want tips from you guys about raising capital, even, especially even on this deal. Yeah, definitely. I think setting clear expectations and communicating mm -hmm. clearly with the investor. And that goes two mm -hmm. ways is really understanding what's their goal. What are they trying to do? And then making sure that there's a good alignment of interest between what you're trying to do and what they're trying to do. Cause not all money is created equal, right? Like mm -hmm. you take the money from the wrong investor, you're going to really have a lot of headaches down the road. So you want to make sure that's a good fit for them and that's a good fit for you. And you do that, I think by being very clear up front about what the expectations are. I think as people start raising capital, they, they start with their close networks of friends and family. And I think that's a really good place to do it. And just generally putting out education of content and just making people aware around you what it is that you do. And I think that goes a really long way um, because people get really interested. I know this has been effective for Dan. It's been effective for me is just, you know, start putting it out there into the world and start communicating these things. And people start coming to you with questions like, oh, I, I've always thought about this, but I didn't know that it was successful. I didn't know how to do it. Maybe you could talk me through it. And, you know, that's how a lot of our relationships start is just helping people conceptualize how they might take part in in the industry. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'd say um, I've never asked somebody to invest in a, one of my deals, never once. People always bring that up to me. And I was meeting with a couple uh, last Friday who I've known for years and they've been seeing my content and her husband's been in the real estate industry. So he's, he's on board with investing, but he, he's just trying to get his wife on the same page. And so we were kind of uh, at a happy hour with uh, my wife was there as well. So it's kind of a, a social thing, but we were talking real estate too. And so, the first, one of the first questions his wife asked was, you know, what do you need from us to invest? You know, kind of implying, you know, what's the minimum or what, a, you know, what's, what's required from us. And, you know, my response was that I need for you to have a, a good understanding of the business model and what it is that we're doing. You know, before we talk about how much money you're going to put in or anything like that, we need to start with education. So my advice to anyone raising capital is to make that your primary um, way of raising capital is to not go out asking for money, but just to go out and educate people. Because once people understand the business model, it pretty much sells itself to you, right? Um, so there's no real sales aspect to it. It's just a matter of getting people to understand it enough to see how, how, how good it is compared to everything else that, that's out there. I love that. Uh, Josh, what is it? Disarm, <clears throat> entice, and? Discover. Discover. So disarm them first entice them with the returns and discover. I think, uh, I think that's exactly what you guys are doing. I, I, I love the model because it's just, you're not asking for money. You're offering them an opportunity. And I think people have to get over that, that hurdle and not show up and throw up. So I, I love that. What I want to ask both of you though, is give the listeners out there a sense of how they can get started. I mean, I want to know from Anthony and from Dan, how did you both get started in real estate? So we started differently, right? Like, so Dan mm -hmm. went a little bit bigger than I did on his first deal. I think your first was a six unit. Mine was a three. And so there's a lot of different ways you can get started. You can go big, you can go small. It just kind of depends on your individual personality type. But before you ever even get to the point that you're looking for a deal, it really comes down to the education again. Like, we'll just keep on hitting on that, that point over and over and over, whether it's investor education or it's your own. You need to really understand what it is that you're doing, how the industry at large works, and picking out which niche it is that's right for you. You know, maybe that's multifamily, maybe it's wholesaling, maybe it's fix and flip. Like, 
some of those don't jive with my personality. And if I had gone into those, I'd be miserable. I'd hate it. Right. And so you have to understand the real estate as a whole well enough to be able to accurately pick what's going to be your focus and then just focus down into it and put, I would say, massive action into that. So that's educating and making time for that, not just finding time, um, going to networking events, joining groups like the Jake and Gino group, I think is really powerful because you're around other like-minded individuals who have similar goals. And that just kind of raises the, the game for everybody. It's the rising tide that lifts all boats. So put yourself in a position to succeed. And I think you do that by putting yourself around others who have already found success. Yeah, I'm going to piggyback on that and say that uh, along with the education piece, really making sure that you are putting yourself in the room with people who are five or 10 years ahead of you is huge Um, because that's going to provide an educational experience for you as well. But when you're actually with people um, in a social setting or if you're just doing phone calls or something, when you actually have a relationship with people who are ahead of you in the game, that really forces you to level up because then you have some accountability. Whereas if you're just doing the self-study thing, reading books, listening to podcasts, it's really easy to just not take any uh, any action forward and making progress. You know, analysis paralysis is what people call it. So, getting yourself in the room with people who are ahead of the game is really going to expedite how quickly you progress. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and finding somebody that can hold you accountable, I think, is really powerful because. That analysis by paralysis, you know, it can be really easy to overeducate and use that as a crutch for not taking action. And so finding an accountability group or an individual a buddy who you say, this is what I'm striving for. This is what I want to do. This is how I'm going to do it and when I'm going to do it by. And then they hold you to it. You know, they're not just patting you on the back and saying, good job, way to read that book. But actually saying, hey, you said you were going to call five brokers this week. Did you call them? Mm-hmm. Why not? And, you know, and like that's an incredibly valuable person if you can find it in your inner circle really hard to find. So you might have to go a little bit further out field from that, but I would put that as a high priority. If you're not the type of person who can hold yourself accountable to a high standard, find ways to, to leverage your, your community around you. Dan, you had started as a real estate agent, correct? Is that how you got into the business? No, I was a corporate analyst, a corporate financial analyst. And then from there, you just transitioned and started buying, buying multifamilies? Yep. Yeah, yeah. The um, the whole analytical aspect of investing in real estate was very similar to what I was doing in the corporate world, as far as valuing, you know, instead of valuing companies and potentially, like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, buying a looking at acquiring a small company or a small competitor, it would be you know, acquiring a, uh, a building, right? So mm-hmm. that process, that process of valuation, um, doing sensitivity sensitivity analysis uh, or stress testing and projecting cash flows and you know, all that stuff was second nature to me. It was just the real estate specific nuances that, that I had to learn. So it was a pretty easy transition. Wow. So I should have asked this in the beginning. Um, what drew you to multifamily? Because it sounds like you have a pretty cool job, right? And it doesn't sound like a corporate analyst will transition into property management. It just seems like two different personality types. So what, yeah. really, what really drew you to multifamily? Well, I've been obsessed with investing in some way, mm-hmm. shape or form since I was probably... 18, 19, and mm-hmm. I'd see movies like Wall Street and stuff like that and think that I wanted to be like a, um, like a broker or something like that, like a stockbroker. And, you know, you get a little bit older, you realize that, you know, that, that industry just doesn't even really exist anymore. But I was, I've always been obsessed with investing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've already, like, throughout college and throughout my younger years, I've played around with everything that's out there, stocks, futures, options, Forex for about 10 minutes. And then, you know, I've tried <laughs> it all. And when I started researching real estate, it was just so simple, not necessarily easy, but it was very simple. It wasn't that complex and you could actually reconcile everything to where it made sense, right? Whereas with the stock market and other things, there was always just this element of unknown and lack Mm -hmm. of control. So when I kind of did the math on that and saw that, okay, this is something that's got a really simple business model, it's extremely scalable, um, and then all the tax benefits, when you get to that point, it's like, okay, there's the cherry on top, like why, you know, why didn't I start doing this 10 years ago, basically? So that was kind of the catalyst. Was when I, after I tried everything else, saw how much it felt like gambling, and then saw real estate and saw how, how uh, safe it was compared to everything else. That was the nail in the coffin for me. That brings up a good point. What do you think holds most people back, even though they may know the power of real estate, the benefits of it, right? It's a basic human need. What do you think holds them back from actually getting into real estate or succeeding in real estate? Their comfort zone, I think. Um, anything, even if it's better than what you have, if it's outside your comfort zone is usually a, a stretch for people. Um, 
you know, it's unrelated, but I think that's why a lot of people stay in bad relationships. You know, it's what they know. And anything that's different is, is scary, even if it's better. So I think the comfort zone is just a really dangerous place, honestly. I love that. And Anthony, I'm going to recommend the book to you because I know you're a voracious reader. It, mm -hmm. It's called Mindset by Carol Dweck. You might have even read oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, definitely. And it's, and it's about the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset. Just piggybacking off of jo answering Josh's question. If you have a fixed mindset and you're in the, you're in the corporate world like Dan, Dan's comfortable there. He, he mm -hmm. can understand it. But Dan and Anthony both have growth mindsets. And they're like, hmm, I know I can do better. I know there's something better out there. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm going to start with a three unit. It doesn't matter. I let me start. And that's where most people get stuck. If you have a fixed mindset, you always have to be right. You, if you're the smartest person in the room, you can't start something new because you're not going to be good at it. So I challenge everybody out there to read the book and, and see if there's a lot of it in you. And that's why I always joke with Josh. I have the growth mindset. If I send out an email or, or uh, Veritas sends me something saying, Hey, you got to stop that. Okay, I'll pivot. I, you know, you're not going to know, but if I have the fixed mindset, I'll never send that email. I will never go into another industry because I'll look stupid. Man, I've looked stupid since I've been born, bro. It ain't going to change. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to continue to look stupid. And it's okay because that's just the way it is. That's the only way you learn something. So for everybody out there, Dan has spoken truth. I mean, right now we're going through the coronavirus. I think multifamily is probably one of the better industries right now in, in real estate. I mean, Airbnbs right now, people are not traveling commercial space or people going to the, I, I don't know, but I think multifamily is a pretty safe space right now. Yeah, um, properties are doing great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I think really read the book. I mean, look, yeah. at, it makes, I mean, you can comment on anything, but for me it was, I read it about a month ago. I was like, holy crap. You know, we tell our kids that they're really smart. You're doing a great job, Veronica. Then all of a sudden she tries something new. She fails at it. She's expecting to do a great job at it. So maybe you don't champion the, the child and say, you know what? The hard work is what got you there. It's not mm -hmm. because you're smart. It's because you're working hard, you're working diligent, you put all your effort into it. And if you do that with everything else, you'll be okay. And there's no such thing as a participation trophy. It's okay that you came in third. The person who came in first deserves the accolades because they worked the hardest and they were the best at it. If you want to be first, you can really work hard and do that. But I'm not going to give you a participation trophy because you came in third. I'm not going to criticize the child either and say you suck because that'll really kill their, <laughs> their, their esteem. But there's a balance there and it's hard to do that as a parent or even like for yourself. You know you're not going to be good at multifamily when you first started. That's why joining an education, joining a platform, getting mentors, getting accountability people will help you because you realize, wow, there's a lot to learn. I don't know a lot. Lot of this stuff and these people sucked at it when they started so maybe i can leverage them so um anthony i'd love to hear your thoughts on that book what you pulled from it. yeah I, I love that book so a little bit about my background is i actually have a master's in psychology and so like I'm, the, the growth mindset fixed mindset topic is one that i'm really passionate about and find really interesting so mm -hmm. if we rewind the conversation a little bit to when we talked about our veritas failure and and then go back a little bit further to when Dan was talking about one of the benefits of being in this particular group was his access to Bill and you as we were doing the syndication model in this fear that like we're going to mess things up. And so it's about recognizing that we fail our way to success. That's just mm -hmm. how we do. Like that's the learning process. Failure is a part of that, but only if we don't make fatal mistakes. So it's about not putting yourself into positions to make fatal mistakes and recognizing when you know, if we mess up the syndication, that has some pretty big consequences for everybody. If we mess up the business name, not such a big consequence. So recognizing when can we move fast and afford to, to fail? And when do we really need to buckle down and make sure that we don't fail? But within all of that is this idea that stepping outside of your, your comfort zone is scary. It's hard because humans generally don't like change because, you know, we're a survival animal. We're just trying mm -hmm. to survive at, at its core. And no matter how bad things are right now in my life, I at least I'm alive. So I know that what I've done up to this point has worked to some degree, but I don't know that if I step outside my growth, my comfort zone, will it continue to be like that? Maybe it'll get even worse. Maybe I'll die. Right. And so that's, that's the fear mindset that a lot of people get into. And so I would say, start small, like put your, put your little toe outside of the, the comfort zone, just go small outside of it and take baby steps until you build up that confidence that comes over time through competence. And then eventually, you know, you're taking on these bigger, harder things that if you had just tried to jump into from the beginning, might have squashed you, right? So understand where your limitations are and when it's okay to push against them and how far against them you can push. 
All right, Anthony, I got a question to piggyback off that. So you said sure. fear holds most people back. So let's say I stick my little toe out and I, and I fail, I fail forward, right? Mm -hmm. Most people, I believe, retreat at the first sign of danger. So they say, oh, you know, I did it. I was right. I confirmed that I'm scared of this. I, I, multifamily is only for rich people. What do you say to people that take that first step, they get hit, bumped on the nose to, to encourage them to keep going? Or, you know, I, I guess kind of elaborate on that. Yeah, I think it's... It's no different than, let's say you have a child, right? If your child stands up and tries to take their first step and they fall over and you say, well, maybe walking's not for you, right? Like nobody would ever say that to their child. They'd be like, no, you're gonna walk. You're like, that's just how you do. You're gonna take your next step, you're gonna fall again. You can take another step. You're probably gonna fall a lot of times before you ever figure it out, but that's just the process, right? And I think as we get older and we get more ingrained into our habits and our patterns of routines, we say, uh, I'm going to stick with what I know and I don't like the discomfort of failing. And so when we take that step and you fall immediately, well, that's to be expected. Like if you found success immediately upon your first attempt at a, a thing, one, it would kind of devalue whatever it was that you were trying to do. But two, mm -hmm. you would be some kind of freak of nature because that's just not how any of this works. Right. And so recognize that it is a process where reps, and this is something Dan talks a lot about is like putting in the reps is, is a prerequisite to getting good at anything to, to build confidence takes time, effort, and uh, I'd say active intention. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous if you do something right the first time. I remember trading right. stocks. I was good, man. And all of a sudden, I'm making money and, and I'm not really, you know, out of college. And all of a sudden, you lose a couple of things. You think you're the smartest person on the planet and you're doing the same thing and something shifts. It's like, wow, maybe I wasn't that smart. So, yeah. and, and you guys, I increase your risk too. If you get lucky yes. right off the bat, you're like, oh, mm -hmm. I should go twice as big. <laughs> And then reality kicks in. Yes, I, I agree with that model of, of starting small because we have a lot of students who want to come on and want to get 100 units in their first year. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that, right? But um, it's the proof of concept. If you're stuck in your mind, you're afraid to take action, but you're telling yourself, I need to do 100 units, but you know you can't do it. It's just like self-fulfilling, which you're, we're gonna, you're not going to be able to do it. Whereas a duplex or a triplex or a quad or a 10 unit or a 20 unit or partnering with somebody is more achievable. You know, it's really, you know, at, you know, you got to fall in love with, with the actions, not the results. And that's what ends up happening. If you fall in love with the partnership and you fall in love with what you're doing, you fall in love with underwriting, you fall in love with the education, that deal, those deals will ultimately come. So I think that's where we have to, to focus on that. You know, um, before we go to the short answers, I do want to ask you both partnerships. You know, you guys are partners. Jake and I are great partners. How do you find partners? What do you look for in a partnership? And how does, how do you make a partnership work? Dan, you well, like, first. Like Anthony said, um, the relationships started, we weren't looking for partners when we met, mm -hmm. right? So that right off the bat set, that set, set things up pretty well because we were just, you know, two guys getting to know each other at a networking event. And then over the course of like a month, maybe two months, it became clear that there were synergies there. So I think, you know, if you're, if you are looking for a partner, um, you know, maybe, I don't know, how, how do I, I mean, look for people where, where their strengths are your weaknesses but also try not to be too aggressive about it because I think the majority of, of partnerships do fail from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. And from what my lawyers told me, it's a lot of them don't work. And it, I think a lot of that comes down to just not having the same um, short and or long-term mm -hmm. goals in mind. And then not being a hundred percent clear from day one, what everyone's roles and responsibilities are. Mm -hmm. If you get those two things or those things nailed down, you're probably pretty good, but you know, just, take a lot of time to go and go date, you know, potential partners because the vast majority of them like, don't last long or don't, don't end well. Mm -hmm. So I think we just got lucky with. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. I've been in a lot of uh, partnerships and the thing that always inevitably makes them fail was unclear expectations set from the beginning mm -hmm. and unclear roles and responsibilities about who's doing what, who ultimately answer, answers for which buckets. And it's not even about who's in charge necessarily, but recognizing where the accountability lies and then how do we hold each other accountable within that context. And so clear expectations, what is it that you want out of this relationship? Where do you want to go? How do you communicate best? How do I communicate best? And trying to meet each other on equal terms. I would say on the, using the dating analogy, you know, if you're really desperate to find a significant other, desperation has a way of kind of turning people off. And so if you're just going out there, you're, you're just trying so hard. You're hitting your head against that door. And I think probably a lot of people have been in that situation. It's like, I need to go and, and find that person. They don't really appear when you want them to. They kind of show up when you finally stop looking and you just go, I'm going to work on me. I'm going to work on what I can control. And you can't really control going out into the world and finding 
a like-minded person who's going to have synergies with you. But you can, you can start working on, okay, what are the qualities that I need to develop that would make me a desirable partner? Mm -hmm. What are the things that I can do that when that opportunity does arise, that person's like, I want to work with them, you know, and what inevitably happens. And if you do that on a long enough time scale, you become a really competent person. And that has a way of attracting other really competent people. And then you get to kind of choose, like, instead of going out and just trying to go to the bar and find you know, the, the one single lady there that might want to, to marry you someday. Instead, you're like, you have people coming to you and you have mm -hmm. your opportunities and you get to choose from them. That's a great analogy and a great tip because it's the same thing with raising capital. If you're really desperate out there and you feel a desperation, I need to raise another hundred thousand dollars. The investors will feel that. And that desperation is really not a, it's not a good thing to have. So I, I wholeheartedly hundred percent agree with that. Let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsors. Gino and I are super excited to tell you about the audiobook version of The Honeybee, which was recently released. The Honeybee tells the story of Noah, a disappointed, disaffected salesman who feels like his life is going nowhere until the day he has a chance encounter with a man named Tom Barnum, the beekeeper. In his charming, down-home way, Tom, the bee man, teaches Noah and his wife, Emma, how to grow their personal wealth using the lessons he learned from his beekeeping passion. In the audio version, Gino and I sat down for an exclusive interview after each chapter where we elaborate on the stings we felt throughout the business, the importance of scaling up, and how we've been able to create multiple streams of revenue. For more information and to get your copy of the audiobook, visit jakeandgino.com forward slash honeybee. All right, guys, got some short answer questions for you here. So Anthony, will have you answer first and Dan. Uh, what's your favorite book and why? Um... Favorite book right now, I would say, is um, I just read Raising Capital for Real Estate by Hunter Thompson. I thought that was a fantastic mm. book that talks about this, just the, the raising capital component of, of multifamily, which I think is a skill set that's uh, incredibly valuable no matter what industry that you want to go into. That's the ability to effectively communicate with others and bring them into your, your, your troop. And so he had a lot of tactical, strategic advice in there I thought was really good. And then another book that I really liked that um, I think, Gina, you've talked about this before, perhaps, is Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. Mm -hmm. And it's all about creating clarity around your personal messaging and your company's messaging so that customers can understand what is it that this person stands for? What is it that I'm getting from them? And I think uh, clear communication is something that, in general, we could all afford to, to tighten up, uh, whether that's personally or in business. And Dan, you... Um, I haven't finished it yet, but I'm uh, a good chunk through. Uh, I'm reading Principles by Ray Dalio right now. I've done a lot of reading um, that are in books that are, um, you know, really kind of micro focused and really um, technical and in the weeds. And this one's just kind of a much higher level uh, look at uh, you know his principles from a very high level that that can be applied to. You know, life, business, real estate, pretty much anything. So mm -hmm. actually really enjoying that one a lot when I thought I would. That's a nice book too, right? <laughs> yeah. Good size. Good size book. Love it. What about best habit for success? Something that I'm uh, really big on is setting intentions. And so going into any opportunity, any engagement, whether it's really mundane, like this conversation, let's say this is mundane, but like, like coming into this podcast, let's say setting an intention beforehand, just understanding what is my best case desired outcome? What does it look like to come out the other side? What would that be? Um, and then keeping that in mind as I go through that activity. And that could be, I'm going to the grocery store right now to get groceries. What's my desired outcome? I want to leave here within 20 minutes with all the food that I need to be able to eat healthy for the rest of the week. Cool. Just by doing that one intention, I can know and move through that task much more efficiently. So I try to do that every day based off of 11 values that I set for myself. And each day I focus on a different one. So that might be growth one day, might be mastery another day, might be self-awareness or positivity. And so I have 11 values that I say, these are really important to me. And this day I'm going to focus my intentions around that one thing. So maybe that's, I want to be positive today. I'm going to try and go into everything today with a happy, gratitude, grateful mindset and, and see where that gets me. Um, I'd say my best habit for success is identifying um, the couple, usually one, two, or maybe three activities that have the biggest impact on my long-term growth, um, either personally or in business. And it's usually, the activities usually are things that are not urgent at all. It can easily be delayed. It can 
And if you don't put those at the forefront of your mind as things that need to be prioritized, they often do get delivered by you know, emails and phone calls and those little day-to-day -day things that, mm -hmm. that just occupy you because they're urgent. You know, so this could be a network, like going out to meeting with uh, brokers or investors or uh, uh, going to networking meetings. Like really easy to kick in on, down the road on those, but because um, you don't get like an immediate payoff really. Mm -hmm. But uh, those activities, if you're consistent with them for long periods of time, uh, do pretty huge dividends. Love that. All right. So there have been a ton of golden nuggets on this episode. And, and I want to cover three that really stood out to me. And Gino, I know you're going to add a bunch to it. Uh, so one, I, I think Anthony, when you're first talking, kind of talked about the knowledge and the execution to get proof of concept. Uh, very similar to what we talk about education times action equals results and then scaling massively once you had that proof of concept. So really love that. Uh, the second would be the power of partnership, right? Finding those that were your weaknesses, are their strengths and vice versa in ways that you're adding value to each other. And then lastly, failing forward, right? So the worst case scenarios you're going to learn here. And as long as you don't repeat the same mistakes, that's growth, right? Failing is a product part of the learning process. And then realizing that that fear of failure is actually what holds most people back and action is what stars fear. So when you feel that, just know that's growth that you're feeling. Uh, Gino, I, I know you got more to add to it. Yeah, I've got, I mean, there, like we could do a podcast just on recap and there's so many golden nuggets in this podcast. I think everyone should go back and really listen to it. But what really stood out with me was choose your niche. Just don't go and focus on everything. Really focus on what you want. If it's multifamily, great. Mobile home parks are great. You know, uh, buying single family homes, fixing and flipping, that's great. Just the mastery element of it and focusing on it and diving down deep. And then once you've, once you've done great at that, hey, let's expand our knowledge, right? We didn't even touch on the multiple streams of revenue that these guys are going to be creating, which is going to be awesome for multifamily. So we could do another show on that, but I think that's really important. But really education times the action and aligning yourself with the right people. And I love with what Anthony said about the intentions, have intentions, you know, what are you doing and why are you doing it? And what is the, what are the desired outcomes? If you know all that and you do that every day with every action, you're going to become really super successful if you continue to do that. And what Dan said, those little things add up when you do that one little meetup, then you do the meetup next week and you become consistent on doing those actions and it's hard. And these two are going to become successful multifamily because that's what it's all about. It's all about delaying the gratification, putting in the hard work on the front end and then on the back end. I mean, they're going to have this property refied out within 18 months get most of their money back and continue to own this asset. There's a lot of work going on, but they're delaying their gratification until it actually ends up and ends up happening 18 months later. So that's really important. Those are great tips. Wow, guys, I love that. How can the audience get a hold of the Invictus Capital team? Good question. Yeah, you can check us out at InvictusCapitalVentures.com or you can just shoot us an email. I'm Anthony and this is Dan at Invictus Capital Ventures. Then we're on LinkedIn, Facebook, we're everywhere. So just Google it, you'll find us. All right. All right, guys, listen, I want to thank both Anthony and Dan for being amazing guests on Movers and Shakers and sharing their story. If you want to be the next Movers and Shakers guest, email me, josh at jakeandgino.com. And if you like the show, please leave us a review. And until next time, let's make it a Movers and Shakers week. See you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks, guys.